Is that better? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, it's pretty funny. I, I, I just the one of the last videos from the last lecture. It's pretty funny when, when the mic gets messed up like that. <laughs> but um, okay. Uh, so I'll post the the grades for the long answers today, and uh, I also post the the solutions. I forgot to post it. Um, but the second test um, it's not going to be cumulative. So um, whatever was on the first test won't be on the second one. Uh, the, the final, quote unquote final, will be uh, just uh, just whatever we covered after the first test. So it'd be, uh, what do we do? Uh, it was from, so the second test will be from chapter six on, correct? What did we get up to uh, in the, uh, for the first test? It was chapter six or seven, correct? I can't recall at the moment. I want to say seven, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I think it was seven was the last material that we covered. Anyway, uh, everything after the first uh, every, everything after the first test will be on the second test. So. Um, can you tell us about the format of the test? Uh, it'll be the same format. Um, yeah, it, it'll be the same format. Well, we'll do uh, the short answers, the oral, and then the and then uh, um, I'll send out the long answer, the long questions on uh, Thursday. Okay. And okay. Then, thank you. Yeah. And then the, the long answers will be due Monday night at midnight again. Um, any other questions on, on the on the final? So, all right, so let, let's begin. So uh, we'll finish up uh, the course with uh, studying uh, cyclical motion, motion that repeats itself. Um, and this is found in nature all, all the time. Um, when your car bounces up and down after hitting a bump, that's uh, an example of it. If the motion repeats, it goes up and down over and over again. Um, a pendulum just many many different things vibrations so when something vibrates it moves back and forth um, over and over again um, and uh, it's a very important phenomenon to study so uh, we'll begin with that and uh, the last two chapters we really introduced uh, a well, we really studied something that, that had this cyclical motion, right? Um, circular motion is cyclical, right? It repeats itself after so many times, right? And, and then you get frequency, which is how many, how many times does it occur in a second? And then the period is how long does it take for one re revolution? And then one cycle is when the motion repeats itself. Uh, is is how long it uh, is uh, one cycle is when when the motion uh, comes back to the beginning to re re repeat itself again um, kind of like what I just did so and this is known as oscillations when, when it uh, oscillates back and forth right um, if you use the word oscillation, right? If somebody is not sure whether they're going to go one path or the other, they oscillate between the two choices, right? They, they weigh both sides and, they, you know, and they go back and forth between the two choices. Um, and that's where the word oscillation really comes from. So, um, now, 
let's look at a spring, um, the motion of a, of a mass on a spring in more detail to see what, what happens. Um, Menorah, uh, we're not going up to chapter 20. We'll, we'll probably finish uh, 14 and uh, 15. And if we have more time next class, we'll do more. Um, but we'll just do 14 and 15. Uh, all right, so let's analyze uh, the spring at different points, right? So if we have a spring, Right, and we have a mass on the spring, M, right? And the equilibrium position, right? Which is right over here. Let me draw it in the center of, in the center of the mass. So this is the equilibrium position, right? And Right now, when it's in its equilibrium, it does not feel a force, right? But when we press it, when we depress it like this, a certain distance from its equilibrium, right? At this moment, it feels a force, right? Pushing back uh, to, the mass feels a force to move it back to its original position, right? The force is this way. And if we stretch the spring out, the same thing occurs. Right? Now it feels a force to go back to its equilibrium position again. Right? So any, any uh, deviation from its equilibrium position, this spring Feel, uh, or uh, this mass feels a force from the spring to have the to have it go back to its original position. It tries to restore the spring to uh, to uh, the original uh, position where the spring um, is is. Uh, is at the original length, right? And this is known as a restoring force, right? So when you compress it, it wants to go back to its uh, the original length. When you stretch it out, the same thing occurs. And what this sets up is that any deviation from this equilibrium position will cause a force to bring it back there. And this will set up um, a cyclical motion, right? So if we have the spring, we compress it a little bit and then we let go, what's gonna happen? Well, it's gonna move, well, it's gonna gain velocity, right? Um, and it's gonna reach this point, right? And at this point, it doesn't feel force, but there's a velocity on it. Right, and that velocity, the kinetic energy associated with that velocity, um, will push it forward. And then when it goes forward, 
it's going to feel, as it moves forward, the force is proportional to, the, to uh, the length, it'll stretch out, and then it'll feel a force backwards, gets back to this position, force is zero, great, but it has a velocity, so it, it kind of overshoots, and the motion repeats itself, right? And so, so right over here, at this point, so let, let's say we depress it, the velocity is zero, right? But it has this force. I want to redraw the force up here so, so that we don't get confused. Right, so the velocity is zero. Then, then I'm going to redraw this picture because uh, this is the way we'll look at it. It's in its equilibrium position. And here, the velocity is some velocity, but it's its maximum velocity, right? And when we look at it through the kinetic energy picture, right, this is U max. So if we, the energy is conserved in the system because it's just this uh, uh, linear force, right? We should write the force up here. Let me erase this guy. No, we need him. So the force of a spring is Kx, right? And the energy is the potential energy plus the kinetic. And this is equal to one half Kx squared plus mv squared, right? So in this position, its energy is all in this kinetic term, right? Plus zero. Then it goes to this equilibrium position and its energy is all in its kinetic. All right, and there's no force here, of course. All right, so there's no force on it. And then, because as a, this, uh, this uh, kinetic energy, it does, uh, it does negative, the spring does negative work on the mass, it slows it down. And then here, the energy is, um is all again is all in its in its potent in the potential energy of the spring right and we'll call this distance x and there's no velocity so what happens is that over here uh, when it has zero velocity, it experiences the highest acceleration. Right here, when, when it's going, when, when it's uh, when it's released, the acceleration accelerates this mass, gets to this point. There's no force, right? And then as it deviates away, the, the force increases and it deaccelerates. It gets to until it slows down and then it accelerates backwards in the other direction and this motion repeats and then we'll go back up to the top like that right or really i should say what happens is it goes back to this position and it goes like this right like this and then it comes back right 
And this is essentially what happens with all oscillations. So most oscillations that you see uh, do this, right? And I define, uh, and they'll oscillate at a certain frequency. It'll repeat, the motion will repeat itself or the cycle, it'll uh, cycle itself every so often. And, uh, right? So then, um, and then, uh, so the frequency, how often this occurs, is one over the period. And we defined period um, in the last couple of lectures, so I won't go over that again, right? And it's one over the period. And then also, what, what else is important to know is the amplitude. What is the amplitude? Well, it's this distance x. How far does the spring stretch? How large is this uh, is um, the deviation from the equilibrium position? That defines the amplitude, right? And then, of course, one cycle is when the motion repeats itself. So, really, one cycle of this. So, one cycle is going in one direction and then coming back and coming back to the starting point. So it'll, it'll compress, you know, go back to equilibrium and then overcompensate past the equilibrium point here and then back to the original position. That would be one cycle, right? Now, and then here, what we'll have is that we'll define X is equal to A over here. And what's interesting, but not surprising, is that we'll put A, right? Is that however much you stretch the spring over, uh, compress the spring over here, L displays the same amount over here. We're keeping the energy constant. The energy doesn't leave the system. So all this potential energy at the start and midway uh, through the cycle, it will be the same. Uh, it will have the same energy. So it will stretch the same amount. Right. Now, um, Now, let's, what's interesting about this, so this motion has a special name. It's called simple harmonic motion. And why, why do we call it that way? Well, it's because you could describe this motion as uh, using um, either a sine or cosine function or even a tangent. Um, and we'll, we'll show this in a second. And we'll, we'll, let's show this right now. So let's let's look at it a little bit differently. Okay. So in, instead of looking at it as a horizontal spring, let's say I hang a spring. Right. And it, without the mass, it has a different equilibrium point. But when you include the mass and gravity, it just stretches out a little bit. Um, they describe it in section 2.1, but I, I won't go over it. It'll just have a new equilibrium position when you add the mass. Mentioned it previously. All right. Now, let, let's say we set this mass in, in this harmonic motion. We pull it down a little bit, and we release it, and it'll just bounce up and down, right? Like cars, on, like a spring of a car, right? When you hit a bump. Um, and, and then let's say we want to record its motion. So here's what we do. We, we attach a pen to the mass and that pen will draw on a piece of paper that scrolls past it. So imagine almost like a printer, right? Where the mass is like the inkjet, 
the paper scrolls past it, and then we, we could record the motion uh, by this, right? So let's say we have that piece of paper and we record the motion, right? So what will it look like? Well, the paper will stretch out um, a certain, uh, will, will have a certain velocity associated with it, right? And if we record this motion, it'll look like a sinusoid. So let's see. So when it's in its middle position, right, its velocity is the greatest, right? So that means the slope of this is going to be the highest, right? Now I'm working backwards in time. Assume that the paper is scrolling this way. So the paper scrolls leftward um, at a certain velocity. And if we record it, so at this position, it has the highest velocity, right? So as we come into it, it'll look like this, right? And then if we work backwards, when it was at the low point over here, it slows down. So what will happen is that it'll, the, the tangent will, the slope will be less. So it'll look something like this, right? And it'll curve right, right around. And then, at this point, right, it'll, it'll de so let's start from the beginning actually. So let's get to this point. Let's say we start with the mass down here, right? Well, it's not moving and we release it, it accelerates, so that means the slope increases and it goes past the equilibrium point and then it slows down as it approaches A, right? And then once it slows down and stops, it then accelerates back downwards, and then it'll repeat. And at this point, we have one cycle, right? Well, this is one cycle, and remember, this is time, right? Because this paper is scrolling backwards like this. So we start like this, and it scrolls, and then it follows it. And over here, again, it slows down to this point, and then it speeds back up to the middle, right? And then it repeats this motion. And if you look at it, it's, it looks like a sinusoid or it's supposed to look like a sinusoid, right? And then this is the period, this is how long it takes, right? And then at this point in the middle, this is one fourth of T, right? And then when it's at the top, This is one half of T. And then over here is three quarters T. And then this is, this is T itself, right? And you can see that it takes the sinusoid shape. Well, why does it take the sinusoid shape? So this sinusoid would show up as a function of position, right? Let's figure out, let's use our tools, the, tool, the, the mathematical tools in our toolbox to show that this is a sinusoid, right? Um, so we'll use second, Newton's second law to show this, right? And normally you'll have this, right? You'll have F net. Now remember this is in one dimension. 
So we'll just work in in one dimension. F net is equal to MA, right? So let me, let me write it. I'm going to reverse it a little bit. MA is equal to, what's the force here? Well, the force is just KX, right? So we have this. Well, this doesn't really tell us much, right? Acceleration is equal to the force. Thank you. We, we already know that. Well, why don't we write the force, the, the, the acceleration a bit differently? How is the accelerate, uh, acceleration related to X, uh, related to the position? Well, it's the second derivative, right? You take two derivatives of X and you get that. So we'll actually write it that way. So we'll write it like this. Where we have the second derivative and the, and the position function, the second derivative of the position and the position function in the same equation, right? Now this thing is just the function of, of one variable, x, right, the position. And we'll analyze this. This is known as a differential equation because it has both, well, this is one form of a differential equation, but when, when, you, when you describe equations in terms of dx dt, the derivatives, and it can have different orders of derivatives, whether it's a first derivative, just you know the velocity dx dt, or second, the acceleration, dx squared dt. Oh, come on, guys. Can I go to my all right? So we have this differential equation where we see the second derivative and the position. And the original function x in the same in the same um, equation, right? And we've seen this in the past. It's just we didn't describe it like this. So let's write it. Let's put it all on one side. We have this. So this is any the equation of position that that satisfies. This differential equation will describe the motion. As long as we satisfy this, you know, we have a function, we take the second derivative, and that is equal to the negative of the first, then we'll have uh, uh, we'll have our function for the position, right? And and a lot of times with these differential equations, it's it's extremely hard to solve. And especially initially when they when they first studied this, this was uh, these differential equations were really studied in the 1800s and and uh, and the early 1900s uh, by a lot of mathematicians. And, and a lot of these were solved that could be extremely difficult. But a lot of times you just end up trying out a solution, and this is called anats. And, and not solution. You just take a guess at it. It's literally what it means in German. And so if we look at this, well, let's try a trig function. And, and let's plug in a trig function to see if that fits it. So let's try this function. We'll, we'll try a cosine function. And well, let's see if this fits into this function. And of course it will, um, obviously. But let's look at it. So I'm gonna erase this. We don't really need this right now. So we have X is equal to cosine. What is its first derivative? Well, 
it's just negative sign, right? And then uh, because the chain rule will pull out an omega, we'll pull out an omega, and this will be negative sign. And then let's look at the second, dx dt. Well, this is, it keeps the negative sign. And then this is just positive cosine, or not positive, this is just cosine. And we pull out the omega, so it becomes omega squared. And we get back our original function, our original uh, trig function. So we could see that well, by the time we reach the second derivative, we get back to the same function. Now, when we plug this in, right, let's plug this in. Well, we'll plug that in. So we'll have, we'll have negative M, right, A, cosine squared, I mean, uh, omega squared T plus five. And this is minus K A cosine T. I'm gonna erase, uh, let me erase this. And we'll get this. Right? Well, would this, does this subtract from each other to give us zero? Well, it can. If you look, uh, the function of t that depends on t is the same, right? It's just cosine. But we have this extra term over here, omega. So what we do is we set omega. Uh, equal to a function of m and k to satisfy this. So let's go through this. Well, everything's multiplied by a and cosine, so they would cancel out. We could cancel these out easily. It's just two terms. We have this. So we end up getting only this and then, uh, and then minus k is equal to zero. So we solve for omega, and we find that omega is equal to k over m. So you guys see this? And when, so, this will satisfy that solution, this differential equation over here, when omega is equal to the square root of m of k over m, right? We plug it in, we get rid of the m's, it's k minus k, it, it solves, right? And if you look at this function, well, let's see what omega is. What does omega tell us? Well, we know from uh, the pre from uh, from uh, circular motion, omega stands for in circular motion. Omega stands for the angular frequency, right? The speed at which it rotates through a certain angle, right? Well, we could use that over here, right? Omega is basically the same definition. It's known. It's still known as the angular frequency. And I'll explain that in a minute. And if we look at it, what this tells us is how fast does this cosine function go from one value back to itself, right? If omega is a large value, right, it'll go through, 
right? You'll multiply t by this function, and let's analyze this as we go around the circle, right? Because this is a cosine function, we can analyze it as we go around the circle, right? So let me, uh, okay. let me explain this a little bit better. Okay, let me draw our, uh, so we have a cosine function. Let's say we start at the top. Ma ma imagine if we had the spring. Instead of stretching it, we start, we lift it up and we, and we let it drop. Right, and then we record the motion. Right, and the motion will go something like this. Right, and it will repeat itself. Right, this is one period. Right. We can translate this into circular motion uh, where one period would be once around the circle. And this is what we use to analyze this angular motion, we, we, uh, this uh, cyclical motion of this, uh, of this uh, spring, right? So instead of saying that it's, well, at this point, we, it's at the top. What we say is it's at, it's at zero over here along this circle. And then at this point, one quarter t, here the velocity is the max, the sine function, well, when is sine max? At this point. So this is one quarter t. If t is the full revolution, so t is, is once around, which corresponds to two pi, right? That's once around the circle. This is one quarter T and this is 90 degrees or we'll use radians, we'll use radians. So when we approach it from this side, that's T is two pi. From this side, T uh, or uh, it's zero on this side, right? And this is one quarter T, right? And that's 90 degrees. So here, we, we, we maximize this sine function, 